morning, everyone. I am not entirely sure what's going to happen today, except I think that it will undoubtedly be wonderful. Uh, as you know, we're probably around 10 or 10, 30 or something like that. We'll have uh, a visitor or more than one from these very exciting events that are going on in Costa Rica. And I won't say much about it until that time, because uh, they can give the background and everything better than I can. And what I'm going to try to do, left to my own devices, is wrap up the story of uh, the Larzac campaign, and then go on to consider some of the other anti-militarism campaigns that took place elsewhere in Europe, especially looking at uh, a couple of chapters in uh, nonviolent social movements. So that, that's my plan. Uh, if you have other plans, let me know. But let's get back to our story. We were approximately, oh, uh, I actually have a couple of announcements also. There's tonight at 7 p.m. There's a concert benefiting Nebe Shalom Wahat Al Salam, which is a biracial uh, high school in, um, with well, the longest, the oldest of its type. This is an interesting kind of nonviolent institution that we haven't, I think, touched on yet. But communities where you try to bring together uh, especially young people from rival communities, see if they can resolve their conflicts. We even do that here at Berkeley. We have a course in peace and conflict studies where, for example, we bring Indian and Pakistani students in, could do this with Armenians and Turks, who knows, and use the neutral turf of the university as a place where they can resolve their conflict with one another and then go back home and use those techniques on the ground. So that's, that's the idea. And there was a uh, Kamal Dewey's priest, I think, named Bruno Hussar, who in the 50s decided that he had to leave France and go to Palestine and set up this school where they would have exactly half Israeli and Palestinian kids. And now there's about eight or 10 experiments like that that are going on in the Holy Land. They are, I think they would, our, our sense is now that they are a very good step, but they are not enough because you get these children together, they have a wonderful time, they, they form these friendships very easily, and then you send them back out into the apartheid situation that they came from and it doesn't hold up. And there's a very heart-rending documentary film called Promises, which is based on it. But in itself, the experiment is uh, terrific. And the earliest one, probably the most successful, is Neve Shalom Slash, Wahat Al Salam, which means Oasis of Peace. And there's a musical event taking place here in Berkeley, benefiting that tonight. And then I want to remind you that next Wednesday, we're having the two speakers from uh, Bilian, which is probably the active hotspot for direct nonviolent resistance against uh, Israeli plans. Uh, and we're going to have a special reception for them that evening for us. Okay. And then there's a talk called Sacred Hospitality Between Religions. I'll just put this in. Because it's, Carrie, I think this is kind of pretty graphic. So enjoy and possibly even go to the talk. Okay, so we're going to get back to Lavzak, and I'm, I've chosen it because, well, because I met Shanti Das, so it gives me a personal connection, but also because it is an unusual example of a sustained campaign that uh, succeeded and was seminal for a whole movement that uh, swept through Europe, and particularly Germany in the decade after, anti-nuclear movement, which took on a slightly different character because uh, the people of Lavzak were opposed to French nuclearization, but it, a new element was added later on in Europe when the Americans wanted to base their missiles on Europe, because you know, it's the old idea, let's you and him fight. And it's slightly easier to destroy Russia from European soil than from American soil for technical reasons. Uh, starting with the Dutch and rapidly and vehemently joined by the Germans, there was a feeling that we don't want these things on our soil. And it was a typically mixed motive thing. It was partly anti-violence, and we just don't want these weapons. We don't want to help you be so violent, a certain degree of that. But certainly also there's a feeling among Germans in particular that, hey, you know, it's 1985 now. World War II is over now, and we're not just here for you to kick around. And I, I remember one German journalist talking about being at the UN and having the East German minister get up speaking in fluent Russian, and then the West German minister get up speaking in fluent English, and they're, they're losing their whole culture, and they just didn't want to be a patsy for the Americans. I mean, are we blaming them? No. But we're, but we're saying that in itself this was a, a different from saying that I'm opposed to violence. I don't think it works. Anyway, it got very big, and it did prevent the deployment of some missiles. And, um, all of that came from Larzac. Other things came from Larzac also. And in, in other ways, too, it kind of helps because it seems to represent every major issue that we think is important in the development of nonviolence since Gandhi and King. And we did a very good job last time uh, talking, spotting these things as they came along. So let's just continue. Um, I was down to November of 1978. And uh, two things happened almost simultaneously. There is a foot march to Paris, We're constantly going, going up to Paris from the uh, Larzac Plateau in the Dordogne. And that was a march of 710 kilometers, which is you know, not a joke. It's a little bit longer than Gandhi's march to the sea. And people knew how to do that by then. And at the same time, there was a judicial order issued that people had to vacate the land that they had designated to take over for the expansion of the military base. So there's an expansion, uh, an escalation, I guess, we're looking for, escalation on both sides. In response to this, uh, 13 men and women got together in the Cathedral of Grodé. I should be putting some of these words on the board, I guess. I think it's feminine. Amy, is it La Dordogne or Le Dordogne? La? Okay. Uh, anyway, Le Dordogne. And uh, that's the region that we're talking about. And of course, the, the depart that's the department. And the commune is Lavazac. And one of the capital cities in the area is Rode, and it has a cathedral there. And so 13 men and women gather to go to do a fast in the cathedral. Uh, at this point, fasting and demonstrations spread rapidly. And that's one of the things that you really want to happen, but it's so very difficult to predict and control. And it's spread into 100 departments. We have people doing sympathy fasts and demonstrations and so forth. So, uh, by the way, Alex and Amy have just done some wonderful contributions to the Meta website. So I want to uh, reinforce that as a useful resource for us. But what makes the connection in my mind now is this question of the fast. We discussed it a lot. Last semester, it's considered the most powerful technique in the arsenal, if you want to call it that, of nonviolent, the nonviolent repertoire. Uh, the most powerful thing that you can do is lay down your life. And one way to do that with enough time that the opponent can respond is by fasting. You know, it's not like dousing yourself with gasoline, and by the time they know about it, it's all over, and you just made this <coughs> statement, whatever kind of statement that is. And that's something we can also discuss. But for fasting, it was a technique that Gandhi used often, probably about 12 or 13 really major fasts that he went on. And in the course of his career, he developed a regular set of guidelines for doing it. And 
So the question before us is, did these people do the right thing? Was it the right guidelines? So did they follow the rules of the game? And again, we're trying not to be judgmental, we're trying to be analytical, because A, who are we to sit in judgment on people who are, you know, losing their livelihoods and risking their lives to protect it? We're not sitting in judgment on anybody. Anyway, our judgment on judgment is that it's not acceptable. But we want to be analytical. The other reason we want to be analytical rather than judgmental is when you're writing your papers, this will be a very important modality to keep in mind. Okay, so Catherine, you want to start us off? Okay, that's a very good question too. Are we talking about the 13 original fasters there in the Vodé, which is sort of the, the spiritual capital of the movement at this point and where it intersects with the public, or the other people who joined them? I guess we're talking about the whole enchilada. Michael? Um, I don't think it was a fast unto death, but it probably was, it, it also certainly was not a time-limited fast. They weren't saying we're going to fast for 10 days. I mean, they were probably saying we're going to fast until you rescind that order, with not specified, you know, dot, 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 what, where it'll lead to. And in one case, there was a person uh, recently, I think it's in Oaxaca, where there's been some very, very interesting uprisings, and I haven't dragged them in here yet because they're not entirely nonviolent, and I don't know a whole lot about them, actually, but it's an extremely interesting thing going on in that city, and there's a guy there that fasted for 71 days, so uh, that's a lot, of, not a lot of beans and tortillas to go without. So, uh, John? Interesting issue John is raising here. Uh, again, it's one that I hadn't considered, but I'm not proud. Uh, uh, yeah, in, inherently, for fasting to work well, it should not depend on numbers. Um, there are times when groups have to do it, like Guantanamo, like Long Cash Prison, which we talked about last semester in the Irish uh, uprising, and we, we mostly decided that that was not according to the rules of the game. But uh, inherently, it's a, a human being has to make this decision for him or herself. I mean, the one thing you absolutely cannot do is coerce other people into fasting, right? <laughs> that would be completely backfire. Uh, so it's a deeply personal commitment that has to be made. And that leads us to the first criterion, I suppose, which in the famous list of five, uh, the one I'm putting first right now is that you have to be the right person to do it. And that, if, that means two things. It has a strategic interpretation and it has a principled interpretation. I'll give you the strategic one because you know, it's sort of a throwaway anyway. And then we'll talk about the deeper meaning of you know, risking your life uh, and doing it in a way that works. And okay, just let me bracket that for a second. When I say that it works, it means that it's persuasive and it awakens the conscience of the opponent. Okay? If it doesn't work, it means one of two things. The opponent doesn't budge, but the opponent budges, gives you what he or she wants, but with a resentment. So, okay? so that's coercive. So in order for it to work, the person doing it has to be the right person, and that means two things. It has to be a person who has some visibility, some clout. You know, you hear that some Joe Blow is fasting somewhere, and, and you know, you say, oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, or, now, this is somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but you may remember that final very, very dramatic scene from the Attenborough movie where Gandhi is fasting, and Sardar Patel comes in, and uh, Patel is a little bit overweight, and Gandhi says to him kind of facetiously, you should join me in this fast and do you some good. And Patel says, when I fast, they let me die. When you fast, they stop riding. Arby? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, anyway, the issue is very clear, and is, is the strategic issue. The strategic issue is, do you stand a chance of reaching your opponent? And you have to be a person th that has some authority and some status in order to do this. But Arby is raising another very interesting point. If you don't have respect, if you don't have status, if you're not considered fully human by your opponent, that doesn't mean that nonviolence is ruled out. I mean, you can gain these things by being nonviolent. My favorite example of that is when Jimmy Carter became president, the first thing he did was he brought Rosa Parks up from the South to be hated in the White House, and he said, if it weren't for you, I would not be president, because you brought dignity to the South. I mean, being a Northerner, I didn't even realize they lacked dignity, but they felt that very keenly. And by having been the venue of a this conspicuous, nonviolent, courageous movement, it raised the prestige of the Southern region throughout the United States, and of the United States throughout the world for that reason. We've reversed all of that now, don't worry. <laughs> okay, but now, does anyone re remember me talking about the really the deeper, especially if we are talking about a serious fast where you're risking your life or willing to lay it down, what being the right person really means? This is one comment I have to add to your essay, Alex. I'm not sure you saw this. I hope you don't mind. Does anyone want to venture a thought about that? Let me, while you're thinking, let me share with you a story. And uh, if I've already told you this, I apologize in advance, but that's how it goes. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did tell you about it actually not long ago. A friend of mine was uh, in Vietnam. He was polluted by Agent Orange and contracted a brain tumor and was being kept alive on life support, his wife and his daughter visiting him every day. And at one point he says, OK, this is enough. I don't want this anymore. Unplug me. So they unplugged him from his life support, and guess what? About five, six hours later, he comes roaring back saying, plug me back in. So what am I getting at here, John? It has a lot to do with the fact that Gandhi heard had a little voice from God telling him to do this. But suppose, uh, suppose you don't believe in God, God forbid, or you don't believe in God as an external speaker. How could we interpret this, Joanna? Yes, that's what I was getting at. Did you want to add something? Yeah. You're, yeah, you're strong enough to overcome or have some actual control over your will to live, which is a very difficult thing to reach. You know. Uh, you have lots of people, well, here's another story, just to drive the point home. That's what teachers do, they drive home points. Uh, there was a British retired military person who was living in a spiritual community in South India, where one of the greatest sages of modern times was uh, the, the saint there, Ramana Maharshi. And this man, Colonel Osborne, was uh, riding his bicycle on the top of Arunachala, which is a pretty high little mountain for Tamil Nadu. And he started back for the ashram, so he's heading his bike down the hill. And as he's shooting downhill on his bicycle, in a very good mood, he felt sort of blissed out. And I mean, after all, you're living with the greatest saint in India, there's a lot of things to feel good about. There's a sweet little daughter and all the rest of it. And up comes the two o'clock bus, trudging, trudging up the hill about, I don't know, 30 or so miles an hour, maybe. And Osborne, so the idea don't on him, I'm in such a good mood. All I have to do is 
on the handlebars, I could end it here, and I don't have to be unhappy ever again. Uh, but he didn't, for some funny reason, that he was not in touch with at that moment. And he got back to the ashram, and he, he asked the, the guru if he did the right thing, and he said, you certainly did the right thing, not to kill yourself, because on the surface of your mind, you were blissed out, but as soon as the body started to really be pulled away, you would have panicked. And uh, you would have been really desperately sorry that you had made that stupid move. So I'm emphasizing the seriousness of being able to voluntarily put your life on the line at such a deep level that it's a meaningful choice, and you are not at some point in the process going to say, I, I give up, bring me some granola, <laughs> this is all over. Um, so that's the first criterion. Um, let's just run through all five of them and then we'll see how we feel about these pastors, though to be sure we don't know a heck of a lot about them. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, very possibly. The second criterion is similar to the first, and that is not only do you have to be the right person to do the fast, the, per the reference public uh, against whom the fast is directed has to be well chosen also. And using Gandhi's famous term, you can only fast against a lover. That means somebody who cares whether you live or die, so that they're going to be reached by this. And while we're at it, it's perfectly possible that that criterion wasn't met here because it's hard to gauge the attitude of the government and the military at this point. Okay, number three, Joanna. Huh? Oh, you have something else to say? Okay. Yeah, no, that, okay. Well, I mean, this could be number three, number five. It doesn't really matter. Remember, I'm a humanities person. I can't handle numbers larger than four anyway. But it has to be a last resort um, because it is uh, so liable to misinterpretation because it can exert a lot of power on the opponent. And in all things concerning nonviolence, you never want to go faster and harder than you have to. You always want to give the opponent the maximum choice to get it. You wake up and say, oh, I, I, now I understand. And that way you've got a real persuasion and that's permanent. And in fact, if I had a little checklist of three or four things that I would tell the peace movement, which I do actually, it's called my website. <laughs> one of the things I would constantly tell them is the timing. Don't go faster than you need to because then you're implying that the opponent will not listen instead of giving them the maximum opportunity to listen. Okay. So that's to be the last resort, and we'll go back systematically and consider whether we think it was or not. Fourth criterion for now. Uh, okay, hold on a second, Catherine. Did you? It has to be a doable demand. Yeah. I mean, let's be realistic. I always talk about these two people who fasted in Washington, D.C. to get Gorbachev and Eisenhower to stop the arms race. You know, that's just not realistic. You've got millions and millions of people, billions and billions of dollars are all this very intense momentum to do this thing. You can't just expect them to snap out of it. And okay, we've got one more. It's going very well. Yeah. Yes, it has to be consistent with the movement. So you think of those Irish. Uh, hunger strikers in Long Cash, here they were out, you know, dynamiting probably Catholic churches and you know, kneecapping people and doing all of this rather not nonviolent stuff. And then when they had no other recourse, suddenly they're going on a hunger strike. Well, you just can't expect that to be very impressive. Okay. Well, let's start with the last mentioned criterion. It looked to you like this was consistent with the rest of the movement. I'm seeing nods of approval. I guess the camera's not picking them up, but yes, they're all nodding in approval. Uh, I think this is a no, this is a no brainer, this one is, because this is one of the most uncontaminated, in accordance with Naples law, uncontaminated nonviolent campaigns that we're ever going to be considering this whole semester. There, as far as I can remember, uh, having read a fair number of accounts of the Larzac campaign in the whole nine and a half years, I'm not aware of even a single episode of violence by any definition, except maybe, of course, what goes on in the heart. I mean, we're not saying that people didn't have any resentment or stuff like that. But in terms of behavior, there are no Molotov cocktails we need to worry about, as we did with the uh, Intifada. There is no ambiguous stone throwing where we have to decide whether this is defiance or an attempt to harm. None of that went on, thanks to our hero, our leader, uh, Lanza del Basso. Okay, so that criterion, I think we're really in good shape. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Do you think it was the right people? Sort of a trick question in a way, because how the hell would we know? <laughs> we really have to know those people and know something about them. I, I mean, this whole theory that nonviolence is possible at a deep and sustained level is predicated on the fact that ordinary people are capable of rising to incredible heights. And we know that when challenged, people can do that. Again, my iconic anecdote in this regard is a woman in San Francisco, her, her son, her little young four or five-year-old son is playing outside. Suddenly she hears a huge noise outside. She runs out of car, has tipped over. Her son is pinned under the car. And everybody's running around panicking. They didn't have 9-11 yet. Uh, what are we going to do? Get a crowbar, get a tow truck. All these big, strong men are running around like chickens without their heads wondering what to do. The mother ran over to the car and grabs hold of the bumper and pricks the damn thing up by one end well, so the men can get her son out from under. Then lets the car drop and probably collapsed at that point. But if you had asked that woman, can you pick up a Ford Falcon? <laughs> she would say, no, you know, you're crazy. I, I can't even pick up a Dishable Citroen or a, or a little Fiat or, or maybe a skateboard, but that's about it. But you know, when put to it, as Shakespeare says, we can do incredible things. So I think we'll just have to leave that one question mark. There may have been among them people who by that time were so committed that they felt that this was a question of do or die and they could carry that down to a deep level in their consciousness and they may have been right. It gets more dubious as the circle spreads out to the wider and wider people. Okay, that's two criteria. We've already heard from Joanna that she doesn't think that the regime was a lover. Wasn't that you who said that? No, okay. We're all one anyway. <laughs> We're all going to get one big grade at the end of the semester. <laughs> so I decide what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, probably not 100% okay.